Okay, we're getting toward the end of our winter quarter. This is uh, lesson 12. We just have one more after this. The title of the lesson is Songs for the Pilgrim Journey, and that is covering Psalms 120 through 134. And these are psalms that people would sing as they went up to Jerusalem for the different festivals. They're called Songs of Ascent. So the quarterly skips Psalm 120. Uh, the Psalms will be covering in depth are Psalm 121, Psalm 127, Psalm 130, and Psalm 133. So we'll do four of them because they're all very short. But Psalm 120 and uh, verse 2 says this. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. And verses 6 and 7 says, Too long has my soul had its dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So he's living in a, in a, amongst hostile people. And the Lord will be with you when you're living among hostile people. You know, Israel right now is living among hostile people all around them. And uh, our, own, our own government is getting more and more hostile toward them. So we want to pray. So, yeah, we do pray for Israel. We pray for determination for them to finish this war against Hamas. We pray that Hamas would be totally dismantled and unable to function. And uh, we do pray for salvation for the IDF and for the Israelis in general and for the Palestinians. The, the, the Lord, you know, the cursing and blessing and cursing that goes along with Israel, we are on the wrong side of that right now. And uh, so, you know, we can expect for disastrous things to happen in the United States because of our abandonment of Israel. Yeah, well, it's on this subject of Psalm 120. Yeah. It's this uh, subject of Psalm 120. When I, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And that is true of the, the Jews. You know, the Jews, they talk about this two-state solution. You can't have a two-state solution with people who, who don't want to get along. They just want to kill you. That's all they want to do. And, you know, it doesn't matter. So there there can be only a one-state solution. Yeah, and I think, and I've heard other pastors at, you know, different, uh, like, podcasts and stuff talk about that the uh, two-state solution is going to be the impetus for the peace treaty with the Antichrist, because Israel will need protection, you know, if they do that. And they're, the whole world is trying to force them to do it. So that's something to watch for from the two-state solution, from supporting Israel. Yeah, you know, Biden says he didn't, doesn't want them to attack Rafa, you know, which is the last big city on the southern border where the remaining Hamas brigades are. He, he wants them to stop before they wipe them out. Well, they need to go wipe them out. So anyway, we pray for, for them. So the first section is section A, Look Beyond the Hills. It's a very famous psalm. It's Psalm uh, 121. Uh, I'll read that one. This is a song of ascents. All of these are songs of ascents. Ascents, as you ascend up to Jerusalem to worship. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. 
The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Okay, so what is the theme of this psalm? Kind of a theme there. Yeah, it's a protection, right? It's talking about your protection. Um, this always makes me think of the sound of music. You know? Yeah. When the Mother Superior, when Maria goes to the Mother Superior and she realizes that the captain is in love with her and she doesn't want to stay, and uh, the Mother Superior looks up and says, look to the hills, you know, from this psalm. And then she sings, climb every mountain, which is a beautiful song, beautiful song. And so Maria goes back. Uh, so that's the synopsis of The Sound of Music, <laughs> which is a great, great show. I have I have it on the uh, you know, tape. That's right. So, you know, because Mother Superior says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains from where shall my help come. And she quotes Psalm 121, verse 1. So the answer is verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And that's true for all of us. You know, we're, we all get into trouble over and over again. And so we, you know, the, the mountains aren't our help, but the Lord is our help. The help comes from the Lord. So even if you lived in Kansas, the Lord can, the Lord can help you. You know, we have mountains around here, but not everybody does. They have been beautiful. Yeah, this is a lovely place to live as far as natural beauty. So look, he, the Lord, will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So this teaches us something about the Lord. The Lord doesn't sleep. Remember in, uh, when Elijah was having the uh, challenge with the Baal worshippers? He kind of mocked them after they were ranting and raving and jumping around for hours and said, well, maybe Baal is asleep. He can't hear you. You know, you need to yell louder. Uh, but the Lord does not sleep. Doesn't need to sleep. I wonder if we'll sleep when we have resurrection bodies. That's a question I don't know the answer to. But um, now I like to sleep. I didn't when I was little, but now I do. So this is when you're walking in fellowship with the Lord. He will not allow your foot to slip. He may test you. Uh, but you will not slip if you stay in fellowship with him. Um, and he's always available no matter what time of day. So you can always go to the Lord in prayer to, to ask for help, or to ask for comfort. Um, he will always be there for you. Then verse 5, the Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade on your right hand, so he is a protector. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Reminds me a little bit of Psalm 23. Yeah, it makes me to lay down beside still waters. And then the Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. So this psalm tells us why we are commanded not to be afraid. Uh, it's not just suggested. You know, we're commanded that we're not to be afraid because the Lord protects us. So if you're afraid, that's an indication that you don't believe that, that the Lord protects you. Um, and he does. So that's why we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry even when we see the world around us falling into decay and disarray. You know, 
We do what we can, but we stay in fellowship with the Lord and we have hope. The Lord will protect us until the time of the rapture when he will take us out of problems, out of problems way. So any other comments on Psalm 121? And then you can sing, climb every mountain. Yeah, I think we're going to go over that one in a little bit. So, okay, we skip Psalms 122 through 125. So I went through and found a verse in each, Psalm 122. And verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. So that's a command. So that's what we want to do. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, because they're at war right now. And, uh, you know, on, on YouTube is a guy who comes on. His name is Yer Pinto. And he gives a daily report on what's going on with the IDF. And he always ends it with, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 123, which is a four-verse psalm. And verse 2 says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he is gracious to us. So do we do that? Look to the Lord our God until he is gracious to us? Yeah, we put our expectations in him that good things will happen. Yeah, that good things will happen, you know, especially when we pray, we do that. We pray and, you know, our prayers shouldn't always be requests. Yeah, they should be requests, but um, there should be other things involved in prayer, praise and uh, thanksgiving and uh, that sort of thing. But when we ask things in prayer, then yes, we wait until God is gracious to us. We wait until we see how he will how he will answer that prayer. That's just like uh, what the servant who we've Dane has been preaching th about the last uh, three weeks. The servant had a very very specific prayer. You know, may the girl that I see and I ask for a drink, may she also say, "I will water your camels also," and may that be the one that God has chosen for Isaac. He, that is a very that, that is a very specific prayer. You know, mostly we we pray in generalities, you know, oh, you know, we pray that everything will be okay and stuff like that. I think it's good to pray specifically. Cuz then you know. Then you know what the answer is. Yeah, you you know, you know God can discern things when you pray a general prayer, but when we pray a specific prayer and it's answered, we say, wow, he was listening, you know, and uh, and that's what happened to the servant. The servant had an answer. It says, before he was done praying, Rebecca showed up. And that was the answer to that prayer, to the servant's prayer, which I think is very cool. And I've had prayers like that. You know, and I, th those are the ones that you, that you remember for years. So, so yeah, we ask the Lord to be gracious to us, and we wait. Our eyes look to the Lord until He is gracious to us. So then, Psalm one twenty four and verse six says, "Blessed be the Lord." who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Verse 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So this is another psalm of protection. And here the psalmist is blessing the Lord, which is what we want to do. You know, we ask for blessing from the Lord, but we want to bless him also. 
He is always worthy of blessing. And uh, so we bless the Lord because he hasn't given us over to destruction, to be torn by the teeth of our enemies. So Psalm 124, verse 2, Had it not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us? Um, if the Lord doesn't protect you, you are in trouble. So, and then uh, in Psalm 125, verse 3, For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land of the righteous. So that makes me think about the United States. Because right now we do have wicked rulers. Um, yeah, they, they do not follow the Lord at all. But we pray for them. We pray for them. Okay, so that's the end of section A and the intervening psalms. So section B is sowing in tears, reaping in joy. And that is Psalm 126, verses 1 through 6. Uh, does somebody want to read that? Uh, Psalm 126. Okay, thank you. All right, so this they're singing about uh, their release from captivity, right? And they were released from captivity in Babylon. It says, when the Lord, again, this is a song of ascents. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. And um, you can read about that in the Bible in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we have a historical record of of when this happened. This is not a fairy tale. It's not uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. It is historical fact. And then it says, Then her mouth was filled with laughter and her tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. You know, that's kind of like in Psalm 123. Was it Psalm 123? The one that says, let us look to the Lord until he is gracious to us. So they had looked to the Lord for 70 years. 70 years in Babylon, Jeremiah told them how long they would be there. You're going to be there 70 years. Of course, they didn't believe him before. <laughs> but afterward, they did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And uh, so, you know, the Lord keeps his word. So they were, their mouth was filled with laughter and their tongue with joyful shouting, the Lord has done great things for them. And, you know, this laughter and shouting was for their freedom, of course, but also due to fulfilled prophecy. You know, it is extremely cool when you see prophecy fulfilled, isn't it? I mean, there's only one book in the world that is like that, and that is this book. And it has fulfilled prophecy. It's, you know, full of it. So Isaiah 44, verse 28, which is, mm, it was probably about 150 years before this happened says, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Uh, Isaiah says of Cyrus in verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name before you're born. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor. 
though you have not known me. So Cyrus was not a believer. But God called him out 150 years in advance as the one who would release the captives. And so they were pretty happy when this happened uh, because Isaiah, one of Isaiah's prophecies had been fulfilled. And then also Daniel, you know, Daniel had prophecies. Daniel was a prophet. Daniel had a prophecies on the timing of when Messiah was coming. And he had uh, Daniel 9.24 said, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, sir, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the priest, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. So that verse talks about 69 weeks in two sections, a small section, seven weeks and 62 weeks. But it says that it will start, this clock will start, with the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, what decree was that? And that decree we can find in Nehemiah. You know, people have checked others, other things happening as to if that could be, but this one fits. This one fits to the day. Um, Nehemiah 2, verse 5. I said to the king, Nehemiah speaking, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So, Nehemiah asked specifically to go to Jerusalem to rebuild it, and, you know, he's talking about the wall. The temple had already been rebuilt. Yeah, he said, and the king. That's right. Yeah, because that was dangerous <laughs> to be sad in front of the king. The king might take your head because he you think he thinks you're you know sad because of him. Yeah. So anyway, that is why their mouth was filled with laughter and their tongue with joyful shouting. Because they, I mean, when you can see God working in history. That is, makes you joyful if you're a follower of the Lord. And the Lord has done great things for them. That's what they were saying. Then verse 4, he says, Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. So they'd already been released, but they're asking for more. Restore our ca captivity. Um, so they're asking for future restoration as the Babylonian restoration is incomplete. You know, because what rest, and we're still looking for that res restoration, aren't we? What are we looking for? We are looking for Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 has yet to happen. It says, the wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. 
for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water, in the haunt of jackals its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So this is what they're asking for. Um, Now, I'm sure they thought when they were released from the captivity, okay, now the kingdom's going to come. Now the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. And what did they find when they went back there? You know, they were eventually successful, but it, there was continual obstruction. There was continual threat of war, of being killed. You know, there was internal problems with sin, intermarriage with the Canaanite women. And, uh, yeah, merchant, the people selling stuff on the Sabbath. And all that. So there's internal problems, external problems. So the kingdom didn't come. Were they released? Yes. Did the nation get restored? Yes, sort of, under Persian leadership. It was under Persian leadership still. But they were let out of captivity. Um, But they're waiting for this restoration, and we are too. Restore our captivity as the streams in the south. And then, so the church is waiting for this too, and we uh, understand that we cannot build this kingdom. Our church understands that. Most of the churches don't. Most of the churches think they're building God's kingdom. Um, Only Jesus can build build his kingdom, because remember in the Isaiah passage, the Lord will come with vengeance. That's how the kingdom will be set up, through violent judgment. The kingdom comes, Jesus himself comes, and and kills all his enemies, basically. It's a bloodbath. And then he sets it up. The church is, does not do that. <laughs> you know. So the, what the church is to do is to recruit people who will be part of Jesus' administration in this coming kingdom that he's going to set up. He's to recruit uh, fellow administrators, you know, based on how we serve him in this lifetime. We will be given some sort of authority in his kingdom, and we will serve under him. But we're not building the kingdom. We're, We're preparing ourselves in preparation for the kingdom. We're calling the wedding guests. Yeah, I mean, we are out recruiting because we would like 100% of people we know to be in this administration with us under King Jesus, you know, because it'll be glorious and it'll be marvelous. And uh, if they're not in it, you know, they'll be in hell, <laughs> which is which we don't want. We don't want that for anyone. Oh, you mean that are still mortal? So, yeah, they'll be there to have babies. So, while we wait for the full restoration, as the church, what do we do? We don't build the kingdom. You know, when you go and you try to build the kingdom, now what you do is you turn into a Marxist. (laughs) That's what the church is doing. The church is turning into a bunch of communists, which is satanic. It is. They're building the Antichrist kingdom, you know. Uh, We don't try to clean the fishbowl. We try to recruit fellow brothers and sisters that will be involved with King Jesus in the coming kingdom 
And we do that by evangelism. We do that by edification, which is teaching. Um, that's the main thing we do in the church. And we are also to glorify God in this age. And how do we do that? We do that through public worship, which we have once a week, and also through the, the changed lives that occur as we evangelize and as we teach. There, there, there will be changed lives that honor the Lord. Yeah, that's the changed lives. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we become unusual. We, we become not normal. So that's First Thessalonians we're, uh, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, tells us what we're to be doing while we wait. You know, I mean, Jesus brings in the kingdom. We don't bring it in. We wait for him. We pray for him to come. I pray for him almost every day to come in the rapture and get me out of here. <laughs> you know, get me out of here because I can't think of any problem I have that will not be fixed by the rapture. <laughs> Everything will be fixed by the rapture, you know. And uh, But until then, it says, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. That's what we're to do. You know, we're to worship the Lord. We're going to lead a quiet life, attend to our own business, support ourselves, don't suck off the teat of the government, don't be dependent on the government for our life. We're to, you know, work as, you know, we're able to and, uh, and serve the Lord. While we wait. Okay, so that is Psalm 126. Oh, okay, so verses 5 and 6. So those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. So they're continuing to their plant their fields, you know, when they're going back and they're kind of disappointed because, yes, they're released from captivity, but they have enemies all around them. And uh, it's not as wonderful as they thought it would be. The kingdom's not here. So they're going to be perfect. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the Lord training us for this uh, kingdom that we're going to be in. So verse 6, he who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed. So he's planting. Well, that's kind of like us uh, evangelizing. Shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, eventually it will happen. So the Lord makes us wait. It's good for us to wait. Um, and, uh, you know, we, especially in this age, you know, of computers, where you don't have to wait for anything, the Lord still makes us wait. <laughs> and And it's something that we need to learn to do. Okay, section C is the house that the Lord builds. Psalm 127. That psalm has five verses. I'll sing that one. This is a psalm written by Solomon. It's also a song of ascents. This psalm is a relaxing psalm, too. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. So that's the one you were talking about, Vicky. Yeah. So having children is a blessing. 
So if you have a lot of children, that's a blessing. I knew a guy in my church in El Paso who had uh, 10. And I, I asked him what their philosophy was on uh, contraception. <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, we just take what the Lord gives us. So he didn't. they didn't try to prevent it. And uh, so he had 10 kids. And he says, you know, it keeps me in prayer. <laughs> so it keeps you dependent on the Lord. And he, he had a wonderful family. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's definitely a, it's definitely a hard life, you know. Um, so, but look at verse 1 and 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labor, labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. So anything you do in the flesh is going to be exhausting and not very fruitful. That's what that's saying. <laughs> if you do something in the flesh, well, what is something in the flesh? It's something that you just think up on your own, and you want to do it, and so you do it. That's doing something in the flesh. Can you do some things? Yeah, a self-made man is a man of the flesh. Can you do things? Yeah, you can do things. Will they turn out? Eh. <laughs> you know, not the way you plan, usually. Yeah, I do do that every morning. In my devotions, I pray and I say, okay, Lord, what would you like me to do today? And this and that, and I write it down. And I check it off. Especially since I've been retired. Because when you're retired, it's kind of a blank slate. It's, it's kind of a blank slate, you know, because when you have work, you get up, you go to work, you know, you do that, you come home, you eat dinner, you go to bed. And it's planned for you. And so, um, yeah. So I, I'm, I can, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Yeah. Yeah. But so now I do, I pray, I read the Bible, and I think, and then I write down what I should do that day. I think the Lord guides me that way. I don't always finish the list. But So <laughs> success and endeavors are not due to our efforts, but to the Lord. So... Now, some people might think, does that mean laziness is okay? You know, just, yeah, the the Bible, especially the Proverbs, uh, really slams laziness. The, the Bible slams laziness. So this is Proverbs 28, 19. He who till... He who tills his land will have plenty of food, but he who follows empty pursuits will have poverty and plenty. So till your land. You know, if you have a farm, yeah, if you have a farm, take care of it. Um, yeah, for the, you know, we're not agrarian now. We live, you know, most of us live in Tacoma. Um, but we do have work. So we're not lazy. We take care of that. Then Proverbs 26, 13 says, this kind of stuff is all through the Proverbs. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. A lion is in the open square. Oh no, I can't go outside. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a discreet answer. So, sluggardy is derided in the Bible. The, the Lord does not want you... Oh, I have more. Let me look at this one. This is Proverbs 24. And you know, if you do this, you pray and you ask the Lord what to do and you have a list, you don't, you're doing things. You are, you, you are using the time the Lord has given you. 
Okay, this is Proverbs 24.30. I pass by the field of the sluggard, and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber, and your want like an armed man. Okay, one more. <laughs> See, the Proverbs is full of these. I just kind of went through and, and looked, you know, just briefly. Uh, let's see. Okay, Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. So it's related to the divine institution of labor. The Lord has given us labor as a as a preservative in sinful society, it's one of the things that keeps society from falling apart. That's why unify, uh, uniform basic income is a terrible idea, where the government just gives everybody money. That is a terrible idea because that goes against this divine institution of labor. The Lord has made us to work, and in the garden, work was for enjoyment. Work was for, it was there, and it was good, and it was for fun, and with the curse, work became difficult. But we still have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it says you will you will survive by the sweat of your face, you know Genesis three nineteen. So work has become difficult, and if you ask anybody with a job, I, I will bet you there is no one who does not have some issue problem with their job something that they don't like you know and that is true of everyone it was certainly true of me and i had a great job you know um so that's just part of the curse so then just you know vicky pointed this up verse three behold children are a gift of the lord the fruit of the womb is a reward so children are a gift. So when you're irritated at your kids, just remember that. <laughs> uh, we're going to be on Psalm, Psalm 130. Yeah, I'm flip, I've been flipping around. Psalm 130 is the next one. But we skipped two now. Let's skip Psalm 128. So Psalm 128, verse 1 says, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So if you, I count you guys among this group. You're among this group. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Okay? So if you fear the Lord and walk in his ways, so you can be saved without walking in his ways. Um, but your your blessing is you will have a blessing from that, and that's going to heaven. But the blessing will be limited if you don't walk in His ways. Blessing grows when you walk in His ways. So, uh, so Psalm one twenty nine is in relation to Israel. Verse 2, many times they have persecuted me from my youth up, yet they have not prevailed against me. Well, isn't that true about Israel? Israel's been attacked and maligned and beaten down for centuries, for millennia, <laughs> and they're still around. You can't get rid of them. You know, they're like a dandelion. They're like a dandelion. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, oh gosh, is it that time already? Time flies when you're having fun. Okay, can I get somebody to read Psalm 130? A cry from the depths. That's verse 1 through 8. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Yeah, so verse 1 and 2 
Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. What puts you into the depths? Hmm? Yeah, that can put you into the depths. Yeah. Does it, yeah, d d does that, yeah, d disaster puts you in the depths, you know, to, um, and, uh, and many times that's due to sin, isn't it? Not always, but most of the time. So, the psalmist needed the Lord to answer his prayer. I mean, in this case, of Psalm 130, it is due to sin because it says, verse 3, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? So he realizes that he's in the depths because he has sinned. And, and bad things have come from that. You know, when you sin, the natural outcome of that is going to be disastrous, unforeseen consequences. You know, the consequences, many times you don't, they come out of the blue from a place you didn't think they would. Yeah, but he says, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So there is forgiveness with the Lord. And for her, we have, for her, for us, we have First John 1, 9. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if God dealt with us on the basis of justice, we would have no hope. But he doesn't. He treats us on the, he operates on grace. And the only way he can do that is because of what Jesus did. If Jesus hadn't done what he did, God would have to deal with us on a basis of justice. Because his holy, holiness would demand it. But because of what Jesus did, he can treat us with grace. So let me um, just read the last psalm, which is very cool. I don't want to let go without you hearing this. So this is Psalm 133, a song of a sense of David. It's only three verses. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, the blessing. The Lord likes it when we're unified. The Lord likes it when we're unified, but, you know, some many churches do it the wrong way in that they... They jettison doctrine in order to get along. You know, there, there. I've heard some pastors saying you shouldn't have a, a a statement on your website about your eschatology because that's divisive. That's d divisive. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus said that he prayed in his high priestly prayer that he wanted us to be one, as he and the Father are one. But like four verses before that, he said, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So that is what the basis of the unity has to be. The basis of the unity has to be this. We're unified because we agree on this. We agree on this. And not because we jettison part of it. We don't jettison part of it. And if people want to agree with this, and, you know, and they teach something different. Don't fight them. We just separate <laughs> from them. We just separate from them. And we don't, you know. So that's the basis of unity. The basis of unity is the, the Bible. A lot of power. So, Lord, we thank you for these songs of ascent, and we thank you for our place of worship. You know, they sang these psalms as they went up to worship you. And so we pray that as we worship you today, that you would be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.